Hi, church. Thanks for joining me this morning. Uh, this is still taking some time and getting used to, but it's good. It's so good to have the ability to connect in so many different ways. I know it's been challenging to keep our distance from friends and from family, but with warm weather coming, it's at least easier for our family to be outside in the yard together. If you're listening here, I hope you're finding those joys in life um, that help lift your eyes to the maker of all things. For me, it's those spring birds, those flocks that come rolling in, um, the songs that bring their life into what's been a long winter. You know, it's fitting that out here, our first signs of spring life are coming the week after Easter. In a time when we are remembering the new life that Jesus has given us through his death on a cross and resurrection into new life. While our attention and our thoughts might be a little distracted these days, with spring also comes the preparations to make the most of our beautiful summer. In our house, one of those things is getting our garden seeds and starting some little sprouts to transplant into the garden once the soil is warmer. And then caring for that garden and giving it the best chance of giving us some tasty fruits and vegetables. My kids just love picking the strawberries and the raspberries, even though they sometimes pick ones that are not yet ripe or pull more than a berry off. Uh, there is just something about eating a garden fresh strawberry that is just hard to replace. It reminds me when I was a boy, there were two friends that had a grapevine on the southwest side of their house. And boy, did I love eating those grapes. We didn't have a grapevine at our house. So it was a specialty for me, almost like some exotic fruit that they had the magic potion to grow. The next time I'm visiting there and it's September, I'll probably have to sneak by and taste them again. The way those grapes wrapped around their house and their porch, that was the closest thing I would get to a vineyard for now. But it was good enough for me. Maybe someday I'll experience a true vineyard, but not anytime soon. This morning, we're going to be looking at Jesus' words about the true vine in John 15. So I want to get us in that vineyard mindset. I need you to put on your gardening hats and gloves for me uh, and picture a beautiful vineyard with rolling hills, with rows upon rows of vines, each anchored to the ground with a thick trunk. Can you picture it? If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to ch John chapter 15, and uh, we can read together. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers. And such branches are picked up and thrown to the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, that my joy may be complete in you and that your joy may be, may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. I am the true vine. I am the true vine, not the false vine. Do you ever think it's strange when Jesus says that he is the true vine? 
a practical piece of Bible study. If Jesus sees it important to emphasize that he's the true vine, we should probably take a little extra effort to ask ourselves, well, what's the vine that's not true? With a bit of study and understanding, this is not a random choice of words by Jesus. See, throughout Jewish history, the vine had become the symbol of Israel. Used on coins, over main doors of synagogues, The metaphor of a vineyard and the vine is quite often used to describe Israel, the vine that God has planted. In Psalm 80, the psalmist says to God, you brought us from Egypt as though we were a tender vine. You cleared the ground for us and we took root and filled the land. The people of the day understood that the grapevine was like the coat of arms, a symbol of their fruitfulness. But now along comes Jesus to say, You may consider yourselves as God's grapevine, but you're not fruitful. Picture Jesus passing through the vineyards, reaching down and grabbing a fresh piece of pruning. You know how Israel is pictured as a vine, which is to produce refreshing fruit, you might say? Well, she failed. I am the authentic vine. I am the genuine vine. I'm not a symbol. I am the fulfillment of all that this symbol suggests. I am the vine, the true one. Israel had been an imperfect foreshadowing of what was found to be perfect in Jesus himself. All other attempts to be true to what God has called his people to had fallen short. But this time things are different. So we're going to unpack this passage a little bit together here. I'm not going to touch on everything. Rather focus in on a few pictures and points for us to grab onto, particularly around our role in the whole vine image. This is one piece of understanding. There is one piece of understanding for me that has been helpful in the way I hear these words. So I want to share it with you. I learned from another wise person. Lean on other people. Don't try and do it all on your own. A preacher by the name of Daryl Johnson has a perspective on this that I find helpful. One of the challenges in our understanding of scripture can be the language barrier. While the Holy Spirit is not bound by that, sometimes our black and white minds can prove to be a bit of a hurdle. With different languages, we get translations that have found different words to express the intent and the original meaning. Daryl Johnson zooms in on this passage from John 15, verse 2, where it says, He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. And sometimes I find this can create a bit of fear in us. Am I bearing enough fruit? Is God going to remove me? In this part of the metaphor, Jesus is talking about branches that are attached to the vine. He says, branch in me. These things are important to note. This is different from later on in verse 6, where Jesus talks of branches that do not remain in him. They are gathered up and and thrown away because they have dried up and have already fallen off. But the initial word of remove in some translations can be challenging in our minds. And Johnson suggests that this is a mistranslation or maybe an overtranslation. The word is better described as lifts up, which can have the meaning of lift up and take away, but not too often. In the vine growing business, just because a branch does not bear fruit does not mean it's automatically cut off. Branches are far too valuable. The usual reason for a branch not bearing fruit is that it's just laying on the ground. So when you think of the gardener coming along, finding a branch that is attached to the vine but not producing fruit. The gardener lifts it up and lets it hang off the trellis or the support wire so that it can once again get the benefit of the vine and once again be fruitful. In other words, there's a big message of grace here. If we remain and abide in Christ and the Father comes along and he looks at us, if we're not bearing fruit, he lifts us up so we can become healthy and bear fruit. If we are already bearing fruit and he prunes us and he focuses us, helps us put more energy into what is giving fruit, shapes our character so that we can become even more fruitful. Either way, God's caring for us. When we are attached to that vine, we don't need to fear being chopped off from Christ because we don't think we're being fruitful enough. If that's the fear you have right now, I want you to stop and It just reminds you of who you are called as a child of God, who is loved and who is known by name. He has adopted you and he calls you his special possession. So rest easy in God's grace 
as you grow and strive to become more like him. Let's pick up back our passage starting at verse 5. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and it withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown to the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, and now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Remain in me. Abide in me. This is the foundation of Jesus' teaching here. Abide in me. But this is also a concept that I know for me has sometimes gone in one year and out the other. In the middle, I agree with it, but it's not quickly understood what abiding in Christ means. Maybe you're with me in this. I think too often we don't pause in these moments and try to get a grasp on this concept that appears to be pretty important to Jesus. So let me pause here for a minute. Abiding in Christ is not some special, mystical, undefinable experience. Abiding in Christ is first something that depends on God's grace, not on how good I am. Yes, our faith is what actively unites us with Christ, but that faith is rooted in the fact that God is the one acting for us. Abiding in Christ means being obedient to him. Letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly, as Paul says in Colossians 3.16. It's making God's word become a direct part of our life, not just something we hear others talk about. Abiding in Christ is to abide in his love. Again, another sentence that can seem almost too feely for us. But it's that we rest our lives on the love of Christ. The love for us that was proven to us on the cross. It's our daily thanks for that demonstration of love. If that's not in your daily routine, find a way. It's these things that are what abiding in Christ looks like. And of course, there's so much more. But that's helped me to get a little tighter on the word abiding in Christ and not feel I'm, I'm lost or, or in some emotional metaphor. So as we understand what it can look like to abide in Christ, we can understand these verses to begin to grasp the significance of the true vine that Jesus is becoming for us. Jesus is talking about being the true vine to his followers. And similar to what we just talked about in abiding, Jesus gives his disciples some practical ways to be a healthy part of the vine. First, if you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear fruit. Second, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. All of which is to my Father's glory. So it's not done so that you look great. It's done so that God is made great and others see that those doing great things are following him to his glory. And God promises to give us these great things directly related to the fruit that we will bear with the power of God's spirit in us. This is not referring to the new boat that I want. This is seeing the fruit produced by the power of God. That is what he will do for us when we ask. And third, remain in my love. Okay, well, how do you do that again? Oh, yeah. We just need to read a bit farther here. If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. What sometimes seems complicated, abiding and pruning and bearing fruit, gets broken down to become rather easy to understand. Love each other as I have loved you. So a side lesson, don't get stuck chasing all the complex issues of faith. 
sometimes just sit in this simplicity that sometimes is right in front of you. It's not easy to do either, but it's not complicated. To be a fruitful part of the vine, we need to remain in Christ, which means to love others the way that Christ has loved us. No problem. Just be like Jesus. We all know that actually that is a bit of a problem. None of us are, are sitting here as having arrived, regardless of our maturity of our faith. Whether you're feeling close to Jesus right now or distant, maybe even feel like this closeness is just not even attainable. Sometimes we need a bit of a, a refocusing. I know I do. Picture this if you will. Maybe even close your eyes. Use your imagination for a second. You are a branch that's connected to the vine. Are you with me? You have rough bark in some places of maturity and fresh new growth in other areas. Maybe there's some leaves. Maybe they're just fluttering in a nice warm morning breeze. Now, I don't want you to look for any fruit on your branch because it's not there yet. We got to be patient here and slow down. Slow down your busy minds is something we're getting more practice at these days anyway. Are you still tracking with me? You're a branch. It goes down and it's attached to the vine trunk, which goes down and is connected to the ground. Okay, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. I want you to try to make fruit appear. Now, here's the question. What were you focusing on when the fruit appeared? Now, I know my tactics are filled with flaws. But we get excited about producing fruit sometimes. And we start to just focus on the fruit. But Greg, I want to bear fruit. You want to know how to be a branch that produces fruit? Stop looking at the end product and start looking at the place where you're connected to the vine, where you're made part of the vine. Stare at it and don't remove your focus from it. This is the point of connection to Christ. Don't even care about the rest of the branch. Forget the delicious fruit. Focus on the place where you're connected. All your effort and energy is given to that place of being connected to Christ. Picture a perfect outline in the bark of, of a cross. After all, it is Christ that has made a way for us to be connected. That's the moment when your branch begins to produce fruit. Christ will bear fruit in you through your being connected to him in the vine. Can you relate this to your life? You ever tried to bear fruit as a follower of Jesus? I know I have. It doesn't end up working very well. It's like the parable that Jesus teaches in Matthew 7. The foolish man builds his house on sand, but when the winds and the rains come, the house is washed away. But the wise man builds his house on solid rock, standing firm in the wind and the rain. Both are building houses. The one on the sand, it might look very nice, appear to have it all together. Might even have people convinced that, oh, there's solid bedrock below this house. But only once the wind and the rain come down does the truth of what this man's house is built on come into light. Don't try so hard to produce fruit that all the focus is just given to a finished product and forgetting the foundation, the anchor point and the connection to the vine. It's when we turn our focus to the foundation to Christ is when he comes in and uses us in a way that surprises us. And when we step back in awe of what God has done through our imperfect self, surprised at the outcome he created amidst our own shortcomings, with all glory and honor going to Christ, not to me. Not only are these moments impactful for the kingdom, but it grows my faith as I see our risen Savior working beyond what I think he can do through me. And personally, these markers for me are what I lean on when I begin to feel weak. And I'm reminded to turn my attention back to Christ and to stop trying so hard to force out fruit. Remain in me, keep my words in you, remain in my love, and follow my commands. 
which is to love one another. Loving each other as Christ has loved you, shown directly through his life and the example he has given us. I hope this is encouraging for you this morning. While a lot of this talk is revolved around each of us individually being connected to the vine, it would not be enough to leave it at that. Because the image of the vine is meant to be one that is, draws out the way for the church to be. That we together are connected to the vine, not just individually. The way that God has paved the way for us is the way together with others. So this week, may you find the creative ways to walk with each other, connect with an old friend, or speak intentionally and meaningful to that casual friend. Connect to continue to reach beyond yourself, knowing that God has given every one of us the opportunity to be connected to his true vine. Love each other, stay in the word, and focus on Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for these words that we can hold, that we can, that we can uh, wrestle with, that we can be encouraged by. Uh, and I pray that you would help us each to find the ways to be connected to you, to recognize the importance of that connection. Uh, help us to, to slow down and to pause and to, and to look back and make that looking back become our looking forward. Thank you for using us to be bearers of, of your news, to be ambassadors of you. Um, be gracious with us. Continue to walk with us. Amen. Thanks for joining me.